Sounds good. All right. Okay. Um, I want to take a look at a few. Uh, I don't know. Packages or functions or, or something, and we'll, we'll take a look at some classification data. <clears throat> okay, so I'm importing NumPy pandas um, load iris to get our iris data. Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with my voice today. Um, and then um, from model selection, we will take train test split. And then uh, we'll look at the uh, cross val score, K neighbors classifier. Maybe we can look at the uh, Gaussian naive Bayes classifier. These, all of these things, you can you can just look look up in the uh, Scikit-Learn helped documentation. Okay, um, let me talk about training and testing. So, <clears throat> whenever you're uh, Trying to like create a model to uh, to model your data, it's it's always a good idea to uh, to split it into like training sets and testing sets, okay? And then further, after you split your data into training and testing, you probably want to perform um, cross validation on your training data, and um, and then after you select a model with cross validation, then you can. Um, Test it on the test data. So, you know, kind of a diagram to show this would be this. Uh, so, this is your entire uh, data set. You're going to um, partition this, okay? And this part will be test. And this part will be uh, training. This is a terrible picture here. It's much harder to draw on a vertical screen. Okay. So then you have your uh, your training data, and then you further break this up, the training data, into um, you know you have your folds. And you do uh, cross validation, right? <clears throat> and, and so the uh, the different folds. If we're doing fourfold cross validation, you use seventy five percent of your training data to train your um, to like make a model, and then you test it on the last fold, or you validate it on the last fold, and then you do this, and then you get you know four different cross validation scores, and then um, and then you can use that to help uh, select your model, right? And then uh, once you have your model selected, then you throw it in against the uh, the actual test data, which was never seen in your uh, model selection. Okay, which is probably how like Kaggle competitions work, um, in that you know they'll have your they'll have a test set of data that they don't release to the competitors at all, and then they have a training set. And then you know you use the training set to figure out you know to propose a model, and then you submit your you know your model your prediction model to uh, the thing, and then it runs it against the test set and gives you a score. Uh, and then probably you know on your own computer you you further split your training data and, and things like that. All right, so we can do something like this um, using train test split, okay? And I just kind of want to illustrate, you know, what this might look like with a small data set. So here I've created um, uh, NumPy uh, a range from uh, 12, so 0 to 11, and I reshaped it to two rows and six columns. So I, I could just reshape it to six rows and two columns, Oops, did I do something wrong? Oh, I have to, I have to do this to import all our stuff. Okay, um, and then I could reshape it to six rows, two columns, um, but NumPy's default behavior is to fill it out row-wise, and in this case, um, for the purpose of illustration, I wanted it to fill out column-wise. So I'm gonna say two rows, six columns, 
and then transpose it. Okay, so you got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. <clears throat> uh, and so this is a kind of a two-dimensional matrix. Over here I've got um, a one-dimensional array with the values 0 through 5, and then I also have another one that's uh, zeros and ones, okay? So this, this one would represent kind of like a, a numeric response, and this one represents a categorical response. So the thing about um, scikit-learn is that even if it's a categorical response, they have to all be coded as numbers. It doesn't like, like if you give it text, like strings, even though they're categories and it's like versicolor, versicolor, satosa, and things like that, it doesn't like that. It wants numbers. So it wants like 0, 1, or 2, you know, category 0, 1, or 2, and, uh, and things like that. So here we got category 0 and category 1. Okay. So there's no way to make a string like a factor, like an R? Uh, there is, uh, but you know they still get coded as numbers at, mm. uh, underneath the thing for for second layer. But yeah, you can make um, you can do uh, an ordered thing. Okay, and then so train test split comes from the scikit learn model selection uh, dot model selection thing. Okay. And so we just call uh, train test split. If you didn't uh, import it like this, you can call call it directly. You can do sklearn. Uh, you, you have to do import sklearn, but then you would do sklearn dot model underscore selection dot train test split. So you know you would have a a heavy import at the beginning. But here we go. Okay. And, uh, and with train test split, what happens is you give it, you know, a NumPy array, and then you say um, how much you want. And so in this case, I've got um, six rows. So I'm going to say I want a third or two rows to go into uh, X train. And then, uh, and then you give it a random state because this is how it um, splits it up. Okay. What is random state? Like what is the one? Uh, I'm sorry. What? What is, what is the random state? Oh, it's kind of like set seed. Oh. Set seed for the um, train test because there's a ra random element because it's randomly selecting which rows to put into the uh, the training data, and then the remainder get put in the test data. Okay. So in this case, the first row would be in train data. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. So so here and then so what train test split does is it will return two values. Okay, or two arrays. So you take it takes in one array. And then it returns to it splits it into two parts. The first one being the training one, and then the second one being the test. So in this case, the train will contain two thirds of the data, and test will contain one third of the data. So when I do this, I've got six rows, and then I do it, and then it puts it selects four rows at random, and puts this in the training, and it puts uh, the other remaining two rows into the test. Okay, and it assigns it. So and a thing about uh, Python is that if a function returns multiple values, you can capture all of them just by saying the, the first value it throws out will be x train, and then the second value it throws out will be x test. Okay. Then you can split um, the y data using uh, the same thing. So in this case, y is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if you use the same random state, it will, um, it will split it the same way. So we can see that, you know, if these ones correspond to these values. We can see that it, indeed it pulls out four zero three five and two one. Okay, and uh, you know if I change, but if I change the random state, then it no longer matches, right? So so that that would be a problem. So you want to make sure you're using the same uh, random state for both of these when when you're doing it. Okay, and and because of that, it's probably better to just do it in one step. Let me uh, split Y train and Y test. Okay, and so with train test split, you can give it multiple uh, multiple arguments. Okay, because uh, train test split allows for uh, you know keyword arguments, the quarks, and you can give it like multiple things, and it will it will understand that oh you gave you gave me two arrays, I'm going to split each of them into two pieces. So this will split them up into four pieces. The first one, because we gave x first, it'll go x train x test, and then we gave it y, and it'll go y train y test, 
and split those up accordingly. And then I can print each of these out. Oops. Print x test and I'll print y train and print y test. Okay. And then there's kind of a convention that we use a capital X for the X matrix and then a lowercase y for the y vector. Uh, and then so we do that. And, and so here if I did uh, random state one, we would get basically the same results as before, but in, in just one, one argument here, okay? Um, if you have <clears throat> like categorical labels, uh, like in this case I got half of them are zeros and half of them are ones, you might want to um, stratify the, uh, the responses, okay? And so this basically makes sure that you're going to have an even number of zeros and an even number of ones appear in your uh, training and test cases, or, or as much as possible, right? And so in this case, I've got three zeros and three ones. And so um, when I split it, I, I call it the same. I'm splitting um, X and Z. And I'm going to say I want a third of the values to go in the test case. The other two thirds, we call a random state. Just pick a number. And then here we're going to say stratify using um, the z. Okay, so z is my vector of zeros and ones. So, well, first of all, let me just show you what happens if I don't include stratify. So, if I uh, don't include stratify, let's see, it's possible to get um, in the test case to have two zeros, and then in the training set, um, um, all three ones in this case, okay? And so th this will probably have poor performance because we didn't get enough zeros or, or ones in, in either thing, okay? So if I say stratify based on this, this will make sure that we get, um, you know, at least one of each value in the, uh, in the test case, okay? And, and so, you know, anyway, so, so there we go. Okay, so if you have a categorical variable, the strength by option or argument. Does that take away from the uh, randomness? Um, no, it's still random, okay? So if, if I change the random state, you'll see different values, right? Zero, four, two, five. So I mean, it's it's less random, just in the same way that stratified sampling is quote less random than true random sampling. Um, like that's the case, but um, but it's still random. Okay, you just you just have the requirement now that in the test case I need you know an even number of label A's and an even number of label B's. Okay, that I don't want like eighty percent A and twenty percent B, which is possible if it was truly random. Okay. Um, it's kind of like, um, what is it, blocked randomized design, which can give you better performance than the true randomized design, right? So it's kind of like that. Okay, and then um, uh, I haven't written this stuff for cross valve score. Here, let me, uh, well, okay, so let's take a look at the uh, iris data. All right, so I'm going to um, call load iris, which we had imported from scikit-learn data sets. And then, um, and then if I ask, what is the uh, type of iris? It will say it's a bunch, okay? And a bunch is kind of like a dictionary, except um, each thing can be like different, uh, <laughs> different data types, okay? So here I ask for the keys, and we see we got the data, we got the target, target names, description, and feature names. So um, if I print out the data, it's going to be like it's just too much. Especially you know if we check out the shape, there's 150 rows. So I'll just ask for the uh, kind of the first five rows, right? And, uh, and and you know this is our class, our old friend, the iris data set, right, that, that we love for classification problems. It's got its own Wikipedia <laughs> entry and stuff, right? 
which you know I looked this up and I was like oh this is like this has good information because you you wonder like where did it come from and it says um, we had uh, you know Ronald Fisher who's like awesome and then Edgar Anderson apparently he was a botanist that studied irises and this, this was like his his thing and anyway how many species of iris are there do you know do you I looked this up, okay. so I do now. Three. <laughs> <laughs> There's like 300. No. <laughs> to the power of two. Iris plant, a genus of flowering plants. There's like so many kinds. 260 to 300 species of flowering plants. So. There. How did we only get three? Huh? How did we only get three then? Well, this is. Mr. Edgar Anderson collected data on this. Didn't you say they measured it by hand? Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah it says two of the three species were collected in the Gasp Peninsula, all from the same pasture and picked on the same day and measured at the same time by the same person with the same apparatus. <laughs> okay, which is important, right? Yeah. This is important to know to kind of indicate like um, trying to minimize variation and, and measurement things like that, right? Like. One thing our stats department, our classes, don't get to afford, which I would have loved, you know, our, if we had unlimited resources and smaller class sizes with 101B, it would be great to like force the kids to actually collect data and experience like how hard it is. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> like just, just like one painful homework assignment where you actually have to like try to take measurements of different things and you realize like um, we did that kind of virtually you did it virtually with the island but it, yeah. it still like the painful part was like waiting two minutes for the timer to run sometimes you know? it's much longer than two minutes <laughs> and uh, I mean that that that's like the the max pain but like if it was just like all right here is this um, thing and you're like you're gonna measure time how long it takes and then you realize like oh my fingers don't move that quickly and like if two people were timing the same thing there's like differences in the timing and how do you anyway all right um so anyway iris iris data. iris data set okay and then we can see you know what are the feature names so we got good old sepal length sepal width petal length petal width all measured in uh, centimeters our target is categorical we've got a bunch of zeros ones and twos our target names are setosa versicola and virginica so Normally, do they, it does it automatically alphabetize it then, or were they? No, no, no. Well, this is in the data set. The zeros are Setosa, the ones are Versicola, and the twos are Virginica. So, so they would just assign it however the data is, so they wouldn't yeah. alphabetize it because um, it happens to be alphabetized in this it, case. It happens to be alphabetized. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And then if you print the description, it's you know all of this stuff, right? Okay. All right, and so we will do um, train test split. We're going to split iris data, iris target. Um, I'll do 20% in the test size, random state one, stratify on iris.target. OK? And then um, we can count how many of each show up in um, Y test. And indeed, we get 10 from each if we do bin count, which is exactly what, what we want. Okay. So this is this is all I've written so far. But that's okay. And then um, what's going on? All right. So um, we've we've split our um, our data and so now let's um, okay so we will fit nearest to neighbors. K nearest neighbors classifier. Okay, so you know it, it's probably a good idea to um, create some plots, right? So we can do um, maybe I need to import Seaborn as S and S, and then uh, see now I need to Seaborn. Plot, right? 
this is what I want, I think. All right, so we'll do um, airplot. Uh, um, let's do our next train. Oh, pandas must, okay, it must be a data frame object. Okay, so I need to do pd.data frame. Uh, all right, so we'll call data this, and then data dot, um, is it names? Would it be iris dot, Train names. All right, and I'll do uh, SMS dot airplot. Pandas doesn't allow columns to be. What did I say? How do you. Is it not names? Yeah, I'm struggling with this. No, I think exactly. All right, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Pandas doesn't allow columns to be created via a new attribute name. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's data dot column names. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just see. Oh, this is. All right, well, anyway, that's fine. Do we need the names? Huh? Do we need the names? No, so we far? don't. We don't. Oh, it's data.columns. I, I know, you know, <laughs> all of our things. Data.columns? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm sure you're. Moment of um, truth. Feature names. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all right. And, the, and so our thing looks like this. Um, in a pair plot, can I color via? Can we do color based on, yeah, how do we do this? Hue. Hue is equal to species. That's what we want. Okay. Oh, but it's not. I don't have species stored in here. I have to do uh, iris dot uh, target. No, it doesn't like it. Okay, never mind. All right. Well, anyway, we'll just leave it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, we're gonna do a k nearest neighbors, and so basically in I guess four dimensional space, we're gonna basically measure like find the and nearest neighbors and um, and use that. Okay, so we have to um, create an instance of our model. So I'm gonna just call this uh, KNN and we're gonna just in create an instance of the K neighbors classifier and <clears throat> um, so let's go to uh, sklearn K neighbors classifier. All right, and you can select a uh, number of neighbors and you know all sorts of stuff as far as like the weights and the algorithm and I don't know what leaf size is, but hmm? I was about to ask what leaf <laughs> yeah. size was. Leaf size passed to ball tree or KD tree. This can affect the speed. All right, I don't know. I'm sure we can read it up something. Okay, but we're gonna do number of neighbors is equal to. Um, Let's try five, okay? So this just creates a model. And if I say print KNN, it's gonna say, this is all we have. We, it hasn't actually been tried to fit to the data. So we're gonna say KNN.fit, and we're gonna take it on X train and uh, Y train. Okay, so now, now it has 
tried to fit the data. And then we can now use it to predict on x underscore test and see how it does. Okay. Ooh. And so these are its predictions. And like, is this any good? We can compare it versus um, versus um, y test. Okay. Can, can I, I do like a community? Situation? Yeah, yeah. So um, let me see. Do this. Do I have to import confusion matrix? Metrics, sklearn dot metrics. Okay, from sklearn metrics, import uh, confusion matrix, and then we will run classifier fit confusion matrix uh, y underscore test versus y underscore predictions. Okay, that's fine. All right, so we do uh, confusion matrix, and we will do our y underscore test versus these are basically our predictions and we'll do that out okay mm. and we see that 10 mm. 10 and then one that was misclassified here okay hmm? yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, and <clears throat> um, okay and you might say like well you know, we arbitrarily just selected a uh, number of neighbors equal to five, right? And you might want to say like, okay, well, what if I did um, something different, right? So what if I did number of neighbors is equal to, um, I don't know, one, okay? Just the nearest neighbor. And then, and so in this case, I would refit uh, my data and then, uh, and then we'll run the uh, confusion matrix here. Now we're getting the same results. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's okay. Let's just uh, try this and see if see at what point it breaks. Probably if, if we use fifteen, it will. <laughs> Am I doing something wrong? No, this is right. Okay. Hey, you broke it. Okay, so we're getting some some different results here. Okay. Uh, and, and we might want to say, um, okay, how can we uh, oops, figure out what's the, uh, the best number of neighbors to select, okay? And so what we can do is we can do, um, there, there's a few things that we can go on, and one is called a uh, hyperparameter uh, search, okay? And basically, this parameter of how many neighbors to use in our classifier, we can say, you know, I want you to try out for one, two, three, all the way up to like 50 or something. And we can just have the computer try out, fit all of these models so we don't have to repeatedly try different numbers of neighbors ourselves. Okay? And, uh, let me just look up the, uh, how we want to do this. Okay. And, uh, and okay, and so this comes from um, model selection. So we're going to do from scikit-learn model selection. We're going to import, it's called uh, grid search cross validation. Okay. And we have to set up something called a parameter grid. And, uh, and basically, 
we set up a, a dictionary here. This is going to be, um, so we make dictionary called uh, parameter grid. And the uh, keyword will be the argument that goes into um, the um, kind of the model. So in our, in our case, it's number of neighbors. And then we're going to create um, a range. So we'll say NP dot A range 1 to 50. And then we're going to create a K neighbors classifier. Okay, so this time, no, we do not specify N neighbors here. Okay, and then we're going to do KNN CV, and this will be, uh, and then we call uh, grid search CV KNN. And we'll pass it the parameter grid. And we do CV equals 5. Okay? So we call grid search CV. We pass it the name of our um, model, KNN, and also uh, we give it the um, you know, kind of the parameters it will use. It will um, search through. Okay. CV equals five means um, we score it based on uh, five-fold cross-validation. So for each, um, <clears throat> so for each of these things, we're going to do. Um, Five-fold cross-validation. Okay, so notice what we're uh, in this case. We are not using the test data at all. Okay, we are only using the training data. So I'm gonna. So once I specify canon CV, then we're gonna call canon underscore CV dot fit. And we'll do uh, X train and Y train. All right, and then it's done. Okay, it returns all of this stuff, and um, and we can ask. Okay, what is the uh, the best parameters? So using um, cross validation. Um, Five-fold cross-validation. It it says the uh, the number of neighbors that gave us the uh, the best performance is thirteen, and uh, our best score there is ninety-eight percent accuracy. Okay. It's missing that one. Yes. Yeah. Well, so this is for the um, the training data. Okay. So we can kind of see. Um, so I can go back and um, and we can specify our K neighbors classifier with um, number of neighbors equal to thirteen. Oops. And then we'll do knn.fit, and we'll use our training and our our training data. So just using our training data, well, let's do our confusion matrix. Our training data versus our X training data uh, versus our predictions made on the training data. Okay. Mm. 
Or maybe it was in, okay. So what is that? Is that, is that about right? I don't know. What is uh, 118 divided by 120? Yeah, I guess that's that was the best score it came up with. Okay, and then we can see, you know, how well does it fit on our test data. And maybe it's going to be exactly the same as what we had before, but at least we, um, yeah. <laughs> at least we know, um, you know, it was this number uh, was selected via, you know, some, some cross validation and things like that. Okay. Um, you know, we could go, go back some more and um, there is a cross val score. Crossval score. All right, we give it the estimator x and y. CV. Okay. Um, how do I choose this? Do cross val score x underscore train y underscore train cv equals five. Let's give it okay. So, <clears throat> um, cv scores equal this. Let's see. So I'll ask print cv scores and print mean of CV scores. Okay, well maybe maybe we're gonna get the same score for all of these things. I don't know. Oh wait. What did I <laughs> KNN was equal to K neighbors classifier with neighbors equals uh, let's let's say two. Okay, so um, so here we've got so we're defining our K neighbors classifier. So this is basically what um, when we did the grid search. And it's using the um, cross validation score. What it's doing is it splits it up into um, when we ask for the cross validation score. So, when it does, um, so basically, when we did uh, back here and we did grid search CV, we said we want five, five fold cross validation. What it's doing is it's <clears throat> basically running these things. So if we weren't doing a grid search, we might want to know our cross validation score here, and we would um, specify a K neighbors classifier here. I've got thirteen neighbors. Make a K nearest neighbors model using thirteen neighbors, and then we're going to ask for it to give us some scores here, which takes our training data and test. Um, and splits it up into five chunks, and it runs our model here. And then, um, and so on each kind of validation set, it figures out you know how many did it get right and how many did it get wrong, right? So when you when you split the training data, which has um, I guess a hundred twenty, and you divide that into five, how many is that? Is that twenty four? Okay. So if you misclassify um, one out of 24, or if you get 23 out of 24, this is where the, this number is. So this is an instance where the nearest neighbors using 13 got, um, you know, missed one, and then it got them all correct, and then it missed one here. 
And so when we did that, we have a total average score of 0.983, okay? So that's that. If we used uh, two nearest neighbors, then um, it misclassified, you know, a few more. And then, you know, if we average across all of these, we get an average score of 95%, okay? And so basically, um, when we did the grid search, we're, we threw in values ranging from 1 through 50, okay? And we said, you know, I'm specifying a K neighbors classifier with one nearest neighbor, two nearest neighbors, three nearest neighbors, and then we're getting back basically the mean of these cross-validation scores, okay? Uh, right now, our scoring method is the default, which is the proportion that it has uh, guessed correctly, okay? Which depending on the, um, the context of the problem, we might not want um, just the proportion that guessed correctly. We might want to use, um, there's, there's a few different metrics. Um, when you do your data camp homework, it, it discusses uh, some of these. Um, but, you know, things like, like if we want to predict uh, weather in California, okay, um, or, you know, weather in Los Angeles, it's like, sunny almost every day and so I could just say here's my magic weather prediction box and it's just a sign that says it'll be sunny right? <laughs> and then and then we could say you know it's like 98% accurate or something right and it's, it's only wrong on the 2% of days where it's not sunny um, but that, that's not very good so they're, they have better metrics for um, uh, you know times when uh, it did truly make a good prediction or bad prediction and uh, you know, there's these concepts of uh, precision and recall, and you can look this up on Wikipedia. Precision and recall, All right? And so, in real life, there are um, everything in the circle is a true positive, and um, uh, I'm sorry, not, 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 uh, not everything in the circle. The, uh, everything on this side are the relevant elements. So this is kind of like um, in this idea of document selection, okay? You want to be able to identify, you know, documents that are relevant or something, okay? So in like spam classification, um, these, these would be uh, spam, and these would be uh, ones that you actually uh, want to receive. And so we want to identify um, things that are, are spam. And, uh, and so what the circle represents is things that our system flags as spam, okay? So if it's truly spam, and it, our system flags it, those are true positives, okay? But if it's over here, and uh, our system flags it, but they're not spam, then these are false positives. These are ones that you want to receive, but they get sent to your spam filter, and then you got to find them and say, sorry, I missed your email, got caught by spam, okay? Over here, these are false negatives. These are spam documents that make it into your inbox, okay? And then over here, true negatives, these are the documents that are real emails that do make it into your inbox. These, these are what we want, okay? Um, precision is basically how many um, questions is uh, how many false positives versus how many true true things. So of the um, true positives so it's true positives, positives divided by everything that gets flagged. So um, basically, what proportion of your spam inbox the the spam folder is not um, is spam, right? So we want that to be like 100%, okay? But if there's a false positive in there, then it'll drop down to like 99 or 95 or 80% if it's like a really bad, if it's like overzealous on saying that this is spam, okay? And then over here, the recall is um, basically what percentage of spam gets flagged, okay? Basically, how many um, spam elements still make it into your inbox, okay? So if the recall is poor, then that means spam documents are, are making it through into your uh, into your inbox. Okay, 
And so that's what recall is. So precision is basically a measure of um, kind of the false positive rate, how many true emails get flagged as spam. Recall is how many spam messages still make it through. So okay. you would want recall to be so you want to... so both of these things we want as close to one as possible okay because if recall is one then that means um, everything um, no spam messages make it through our inbox and if precision is one then it means no um, real messages get flagged as spam okay, okay. Cool. yeah no no is there going to be quiz on Wednesday? I don't know. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have an off week for Ooh. for quizzes. But then I don't. Yeah. Well. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Well, I already on it already record. came out of my mouth. On the so. record. <laughs> so we'll have no. We'll do. A, we'll have a, a quiz free week. We'll see how Ooh. the attendance goes. <laughs> Just don't tell the rest of the people who aren't here. I know, right? That's all you have to do. Someone's gonna ask on Piazza. 